We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is returning guest, Brian Hirschman, managing partner of Hirschman Capital. How are you today, Brian? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Great to have you back. And the last time you were on the show was in September. You were extremely bearish on most asset classes. And we talked about how Value Walk had named your fund the world's most bearish hedge fund. So have your views changed since then? And maybe give us a little bit of an update on how you see things progressing. Sure. The short answer is my views haven't changed. And as I'll explain in a second, I think all the bubbles that we discussed in September have only gotten bigger since we last spoke. But despite that, despite the fact that my fund is probably the most bearish hedge fund out there, my fund's gold mining investments have continued to perform very well. In fact, we finished last year up 52%. And more importantly, we've now averaged 20% per year over the last seven years which is far better than all our benchmarks. In fact, even if these bubbles continue, and even though I remain extremely bearish in most asset classes, I expect my fund to continue to do very well, even if the current frothy market conditions continue. Now, shifting gears to the bond market, US government debt to GDP is now approaching 130%. And as we discussed the last time I was on the show, I recently completed a study that looked at every past situation where government debt had been greater than 130%. And I found that in 51 out of 52 of those situations, the government defaulted either through restructuring, devaluation, high inflation, or outright default. And what that tells us is that the US government almost certainly won't be able to get out of its current situation without defaulting. And that default will most likely occur through much higher inflation. And as we also discussed on the show last time, there's almost nothing the Fed can do to prevent that sort of debt crisis. I can't emphasize that enough because it seems the biggest misconception in markets right now is that people think the Fed can always keep interest rates low. And if that were the case, if central banks could do that, no government would ever default. But instead, just in the last few years, we've had Argentina, Ecuador, Lebanon, Turkey, Venezuela, and others that have all had government debt crises or government defaults, even though they had central banks. Thus, it's obvious that central banks are not invincible. And Warren Buffett said something similar last year when he said that if governments could always borrow unlimited amounts and negative interest rates, it would have been discovered 2,000 years ago, not just in the last few years, which I think is Buffett's way of saying we're in a massive bond bubble and people have way too much confidence in government's ability to borrow and central banks' ability to keep interest rates low. Now, shifting to the stock market, US equities are now almost as overvalued as bonds and have become even more overvalued since we last spoke in September. I think one of the most useful valuation yardsticks is probably the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio or CAPE ratio, which is the ratio of equities total market capitalization to their average earnings for the preceding 10 years. And the advantage of this metric is by taking the average earnings over the prior 10 years, you smooth out the effect of various economic expansions and recessions. And historically, CAPE has been a great predictor of long-term equity returns. When CAPE has been high, future equity returns have tended to be below, have tended to be low, and vice versa. And currently, US equities CAPE ratio is around 36 times. That means that US equities are now trading for more than double their long-term average uh, CAPE ratio of 15 times. And they would need to fall 60% just to get back to a, a normal valuation. Plus, if you have the bond bubble burst and then inflation spikes, and then you have US equities return to their valuation during the 1970s US great inflation crisis, then US equities would need to fall around 80%. And what's also incredible, as we were just discussing before the show started, 
is even as you have this bubble in the U.S. stock market, you also we also seem to be having another U.S. housing bubble only 15 years after the last one. Residential real estate prices in the U.S. are now 50% above their long-term trend and are almost back to their 2006 peaks. And you also have price to rent and price to income ratios that are way above their historical averages and almost back to their peaks in 2006. Lastly, across the Pacific in China, which is very important because it's the world's second largest economy, we still have a triple bubble in debt, in construction spending, and also in real estate valuations. And a good example of that is in a single month last year, China produced and consumed as much cement as the United States consumes in an entire 12 month year which is just an incredible discrepancy. And since China is expected to be the largest contributor to global economic growth over the next five years, if its bubbles burst, it's going to almost certainly cripple global growth. And I think the most important idea perhaps is that due to the interconnectedness of the global financial system, a collapse of any one of these bubbles in bonds in China and US real estate or US equities dramatically increases the odds that they all collapse simultaneously. For example, if the US were to have an inflation crisis, then global interest rates would probably spike, and that would probably crush equity and real estate prices across the world. And we got a little taste of that interconnectedness in 2008, when the US housing market decline almost triggered a global depression. However, as Jim Rogers has noted, Global debt levels are now much higher than they were in 2008, so the next crisis could easily be the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Another thing that's related to this that I often get asked is, what's going to trigger the bubble's collapse? And I think it's important to remember that for a market crash to happen, we don't need a major trigger event. For example, there wasn't any Lehman Brothers event, Lehman Brothers moment before the stock market crashes in 1929, in 1987, or in 2000. And I think another investor came up with a great analogy when he said that an overvalued market is analogous to a ruler balanced on somebody's hand. The ruler is going to fall inevitably because it's in a very unstable position, but the trigger to cause the ruler to fall could be any one of many different little things. It could be a tiny breeze or a tiny hand movement. So we don't know what's going to cause the current bubbles to pop. It could be any number of many small things. That said, there's lots of potential triggers that could cause one of the bubbles to end. For instance, we could have an increase in inflation expectations. We could have a major default by a government or corporation that causes investors to reassess risk everywhere. Or we could have a, a small stock market decline that turns into an avalanche because of algorithmic trading and the increase in leverage in the stock market. Thus, there are a lot of different things that could pop the bubbles. And the key point is that the end is inevitable, even if the catalyst is uncertain. I want to go back to something you said there, Brian, and, and you're talking about the interest rates rising dramatically. Let's say U.S. interest rates rising dramatically. So don't you think the Fed is going to have to control those through some type of yield curve control because they're not able to, let's say, cover their obligations if the interest rates really do accelerate to the upside? Yeah, I think, and this goes back to something we were talking about earlier, if central banks could always control interest rates using yield curve control, then no government would ever have a default because every central bank would just use yield curve control to keep rates low. But that's not the case. And the issue is that printing money to buy bonds, which is essentially what yield curve control would be, doesn't work very well when a government is having a debt crisis. In order for quantitative easing for bond purchases by the central bank to work, the central bank needs to be able to fund those purchases by issuing short-term debt. And this goes back to something that we talked about on the show last time. Most people think that the Fed is in central banks globally are implementing their bond purchases by printing money to get the cash to buy the bonds. But in reality, the Fed is actually issuing short-term debt 
to fund those bond purchases. And that short-term debt takes the form of excess reserves that are held at the Fed. So the Fed is borrowing from banks by paying interest on these deposits, which are called excess reserves. And the holders of the deposits are commercial banks and the deposits are held at the Fed. So the Fed is acting like a gigantic hedge fund. It's borrowing at a low interest rate from commercial banks, and then it's using that cash to buy these bond purchases. The problem is, and this goes back to your question, is if the government, if the US government is having a debt crisis, the Fed, which is part of the US government, is not gonna be able to borrow at 0% anymore. So it's not gonna be able to easily implement this carry trade. If US interest rates spike to say 5% or 10%, then the Fed is gonna to have to pay a comparable interest rate on its deposits that it's borrowing from commercial banks. And that means that it's not going to be able to easily fund its bond purchases because it has to borrow at a very expensive rate. And so that's kind of how this carry trade would fall apart in a US government debt crisis. And of course, in that debt crisis scenario, the Fed would have to borrow at 5 or 10% because if it just printed the money, then that would massively increase the money supply, and that would cause inflation. And so the Fed in that situation would not have any good option for implementing its yield curve control. Borrowing at 5 to 10% to buy bonds would not be attractive, and printing money to buy bonds would not be attractive either because it would cause massive inflation. So Brian, the last time we spoke, gold was less than $100 from its all-time high. And since then, we've seen it slide back down to, you know, just below the $1,700 level, kind of bounce around there, find some support. So has your long-term outlook for gold changed at all because of that? Sure. I'm still very bullish on gold. And so my outlook has not changed. And I think any crisis should be a major windfall for gold investors and for the gold mining equities in my fund. Gold is still not above its long-term average valuation using the proprietary method that I use to value gold. And gold tends to do very well when there's greater concern about default, inflation, or the risk of equities. Thus, I expect gold to soar if any of those bubbles burst. And I think my fund might appreciate more than 500% as our gold mining equities soar in value. Earlier, I mentioned how 51 out of 52 countries with 130% government debt to GDP defaulted. Importantly, those defaults usually occurred within a few years of the countries crossing that 130% threshold. That suggests it won't be long before the US bond market collapses, if history is any guide. And assuming gold returns to its valuation during the 1980 inflation crisis, gold should go above 6,000 in the next inflation crisis. And that makes intuitive sense since gold market capitalization is small compared to the value of all the world's debts and all the world's stock markets. Thus, a small percentage shift in investors' portfolio allocations from debt and equities to gold could cause a massive increase in the gold price because the market capitalization of the gold market of gold is very small compared to the value of all the world's debt and all the world's equities. And once those asset classes start selling off, then there's going to be a lot of capital looking for a new home. As you mentioned the bond market, Brian, it makes me wonder if the, the fact that we've seen less foreign investment in U.S. bonds as of late could be a symptom of this, uh, let's say, this system or this default starting to happen? Yes, it's definitely possible. Traditionally, countries that have borrowed more from foreigners have defaulted sooner. Uh, generally, people are more wary about lending to a foreign country than they are to lending to their own country. Investors have a home bias, for lack of a, a better term. So it wouldn't surprise me if the crisis began with foreigners becoming reluctant to buy U.S. debt. Excellent. So how about your thoughts towards investing in silver as an asset class, Brian? Is it almost too difficult to do from your point of view, considering how few primary silver producers there are in the world? Yes, I think that's a good point. One issue we have is it's tough to find deposits of just silver. Silver typically occurs with lead and zinc. 
And we don't want to invest in lead and zinc since those tend to be more pro-cyclical metals and they're more positively correlated with the economic cycle. I'm quite bearish on China and you'd expect if the bubble in China were to collapse, that it would be very negative for lead and zinc prices. And so we don't want to invest in silver mines if a lot of the value is coming from lead and zinc, and it's very difficult to find mines that are just silver. Interesting consideration there. So how much more attractive does gold and gold-related equities become to you as they go down, considering the fundamental factors that we see as a backdrop here? Yeah, fortunately, our fund has performed well this year, and we're relatively flat, even though the GDXJ, for instance, is down quite substantially. But yeah, we're we're value investors. As gold goes down, it becomes more undervalued and our expected future returns increase. And as gold mining equities sell off, then they start to trade at a greater discount to our estimate of their long-term intrinsic value. So certainly when prices get cheaper, these securities become more attractive, just as if the the price of the US stock market declined by 60%, then it would be much more attractive to us then than it is now. I think this is a great way to frame how to think about, let's say, these equities, as long as you have, let's say, long-term conviction in the fundamentals. But I want to dig into that a little bit more, Brian. You wrote in your most recent letter that our gold mining equities are trading at $200 per gold reserve ounce versus the $1,600 per reserve ounce that Berkshire Hathaway had recently paid for Barrick. So can you tell us more about this valuation metric and how you use it and how it lets you analyze these different equities? Sure. I think ultimately the value of any asset is the present value of its future cash flows. So usually when we're deciding whether or not to invest in a mine, we're going to do some sort of present value analysis, discounted present value analysis. And that's going to be a very important consideration. But we also look at a range of other valuation metrics where we look at a company's market capitalization relative to its gold reserves or its market capitalization relative to its uh, gold resources. And those metrics are imperfect because they don't... uh, take into account the time value of money the way that a present value calculation does, but they're very simple. And so they're useful sometimes for comparing mines. And so I used that metric in the letter just because it was a very simple way of illustrating the massive valuation disconnect that we have between larger companies that are in the GDX and these orphaned gold mining companies that are very high quality companies, but are trading at much lower valuations because simply because they're not eligible for the gold mining ETFs. Interesting. So Brian, because you spend so much time thinking about gold and ways to, let's say, maximize your returns in it, what are some of the best ways that you think there are to invest in gold itself? Sure. Great question. As you might expect, I think my fund is probably the best way to invest in gold. After all, we've appreciated 20% per year over the past seven years, whereas gold and the gold mining index have only appreciated 7 and 10% per year, respectively. But first, let me talk a little bit about the two issues I have with investing in gold bullion or investing in the GLD ETF. I think the first issue is that gold's historical long-term inflation-adjusted return is only around 1%, which is, of course, much lower than global equities inflation-adjusted historical return of closer to 5%. Thus, over the very long term, let's say 20 years or 30 years, then gold is going to underperform equities. What timeline is that over? I would say when I quoted that 1% and that's 5%, that's over the last 130 years. So over very long time periods. And as you say, that's inflation adjusted, right? Exactly. That's a real return adjusted for inflation. The other issue I have with investing in the gold ETF is that although gold isn't overvalued using my proprietary method, it's not dramatically undervalued either. And so that means, well, I certainly expect gold to go far higher if the bubbles burst, just as it went extremely high during the US inflation crisis in the 1970s. 
that means we may not get a lot of valuation increase until the bubbles burst. And so I think those are some of the reasons that Berkshire Hathaway decided to invest in Barrick Gold instead of investing in a, a gold ETF. It's kind of their way of saying that they think gold miners are better investment. After all, if the gold price doesn't do anything, Barrick is still going to generate cash flow for its shareholders. Plus, if the gold price surges, then shareholders are going to benefit because they have a call option on Barrick's undeveloped gold ounces and on its exploration assets. And so for maybe for Berkshire, Barrick may have been the best option. But as we were just discussing a minute ago, I think for smaller investors, there's much better opportunities in these small yet high quality gold mining companies that aren't that are undervalued primarily because they aren't eligible for gold mining ETFs. And as you might guess, that's what my fund is, is currently focused on. And the opportunity exists because most gold mine investors, they tend to buy the ETF because it's very liquid, it's easy to trade, and it's also very simple. But it seems like that good idea has been taken a bit too far, and the gold mining equities that are in the ETFs are now trading at these outrageous multiples that you just mentioned a few minutes ago. And in my letter, I mentioned that there was a eight to one valuation differential where Barrick, for example, is trading at $1,600 per gold reserve ounce. And the companies in my portfolio are trading at only $200 per reserve ounce. But it's not as if the companies I'm investing in have worse margins. They also have very good margins, great mine life, very good exploration potential. They're in very safe jurisdictions. They have solid management. So it seems like you can buy the same thing as that Berkshire is buying, but you can pay one eighth the price if you invest in these smaller companies. And it's common sense. You don't need to be a hedge fund manager to realize that's probably a good trade. And this valuation disparity should go away over time. For instance, the larger miners will start acquiring these smaller miners because their valuations are so much lower, or you'll see investors start to shift to the smaller miners because their cash flow production is going to be so much better at current valuations. And another important thing, I think, is that because the valuations are so much lower on these smaller companies, I can make extremely conservative assumptions about gold prices and future production costs, and they're still trading at large discounts to the present value of their future cash flows. For instance, I can assume a 1250 future gold price versus the current gold price of around 1750 and these companies are still trading at massive discounts to the present value of their future cash flows. So that means you get downside protection here that you don't get with ETF or you don't get with the gold gold bullion ETF. And of course, that means that our portfolio should appreciate even if gold prices don't do anything as the gap between our company's market caps and their present values narrows. And the issue for most gold mutual funds is they're simply too big to capitalize on these smaller opportunities to invest in these smaller companies. But my fund's more nimble, so we can take advantage of that. And that, of course, has helped our performance. So Brian, I was just going to ask, using that framework that the way you just described how you're looking at these companies, that basically removes risk in a way. It sounds like you're able to look at these opportunities and in a way, they seem less risky to you than let's say investing in a company that seems to really get more attention, right? Yes, exactly. I think the companies in our portfolio they're much lower risk than exploration companies. I think exploration companies, even though they're small gold mining companies, they're still quite risky. I think historically, most exploration companies have gone under. So I certainly wouldn't describe those companies as low risk. And I probably wouldn't describe the companies in the ETFs as low risk either, because they're trading at far higher valuations. So you have some risk that they will underperform our portfolio if the valuations of the larger companies decline. But for our portfolio, I do think, as you suggested, it is very low risk for a long-term investor. And the way I'll explain that is there's really two main risks that our portfolio is exposed to. And I don't think either is a significant concern for a long-term investor. And the first risk is geological risk, which is a risk that a mine produces less gold than expected. And we address that by only investing in mines where there's been extensive 
pre-production drilling. So there's no exploration companies, which may not even have a deposit yet. And usually when you've done extensive drilling, the production forecasts certainly aren't perfect, but they're usually correct. And so I think that helps to explain why our fund has never had a realized loss on any investment since the fund launched in 2014. And we also address the geological risk by owning a portfolio of 10 to 15 companies, which diversifies the risk so that if a few of our companies have geological issues in the future, it shouldn't have a major impact on our portfolio due to its diversification. The other risk that our portfolio or any gold fund is exposed to is, of course, gold price risk. And I think for a long-term investor, that risk seems low because as we discussed earlier, the bubbles in equities and real estate and bonds, they're very old. So history tells us that they should probably burst soon. And when they do, that should send gold soaring. Plus, as we were discussing a few minutes ago, because the valuations are so low, our companies should appreciate even if gold doesn't appreciate. And finally, the average production cost for our mines is only around $900, which compares to the current gold price of around $1,750. So if the gold price dips temporarily, our mines aren't going to be affected that much, and therefore temporary gold price fluctuations don't seem like a major long-term risk. I think kind of the most difficult macroeconomic scenario for gold would be if there was a repeat of the late 1990s, where the US equity bubble got much bigger, while at the same time, the US government started paying down its debt as it was doing in the late 1990s. However, I think the probability of that happening seems close to zero, <laughs> given that the equity bubble <laughs> is quite old. And given that the US government is expected to run massive deficits, even if we use very optimistic projections. And I think as long as the US government continues to be financially reckless, investors are very unlikely to abandon gold because they'll want to continue to protect themselves against the inflation scenario. So if I were to quantify that, I'd say maybe there's a 95% plus chance that the bubbles burst and we make more than five times our money. And then there's maybe a less than 2% chance that somehow the government starts paying down its debt and we experience a severe but probably temporary decline due to temporarily lower gold price. That sounds like the same reasoning that Rick Rule mentions when he thinks about what he would need to change his mind about being in this gold trade. So it's interesting that you bring those exact circumstances up. But Brian, I spoke with another fund manager at the beginning of the week here, and he was telling us about how he rebalances positions within his portfolio, taking profits from outperforming instruments as they reach a set percentage of his portfolio and reinvesting that capital into other sections of the portfolio that aren't performing concurrently. So do you have any rules like that on rebalancing your portfolio and trimming position sizes when they get to a certain size? Yes, we definitely think about things in a similar way. And I think that's it's a common approach among value investors. And I'm very much a value investor, even though I'm investing in an area where traditionally value investors haven't been a focus just as much. But our approach to investing in the gold mining sector is very much a value-oriented approach. So when, when one of our investments outperforms the other investments in the portfolio, that means that its expected return is now lower than it was before. And so we probably won't be adding as much to that position or we'll start to consider to reduce it. And when a company underperforms, then we'll always, if its intrinsic value hasn't changed, then we'll consider adding more because it's if its intrinsic value, if its present value of its future cash flows haven't changed and the stock price has declined, that means that the expected return on the investment has improved relative to the other companies in the portfolio and also in absolute returns, the expected return would have improved. And as far as concentration, I think you bring up a great question because due to the geological risk we were talking about a moment ago, a portfolio of gold mining companies shouldn't be as concentrated as a portfolio of, let's say, consumer staples companies or something like that, because you always have that geological risk that you can't completely eliminate no matter how much drilling you've done, no matter how much testing you've done before you 
mine the deposit. And so that means we do try to keep our positions, if they have geological risk, below a certain threshold to limit our exposure to any one geological problem at a particular deposit. And when we do have large investments, it's because we found a special situation where the company, for whatever reason, doesn't have much geological risk. Excellent. Another thing that you mentioned in the recent letter is how gold mine production will not affect gold prices as much as shale oil production has affected oil prices. Can you dive into this a little bit further and explain it to us? Sure. A Bitcoin bull, who is also a major gold bear, was recently arguing that gold mine production was going to cause gold prices to fall, just as shale oil production has caused oil prices to fall. However, Gold mine production is very different from oil well production because gold mine production is a tiny portion of the world's supply of gold. With oil, it's typical of industrial commodities in that nearly all of the oil that is produced each year is quickly consumed. And the amount of oil that's stored each year in tanks or in oil tankers is very small relative to the amount of oil that's produced each year. Therefore, oil production influences prices a lot more than oil inventories do because oil production is gigantic relative to oil inventories. With gold, it's very different because nearly all the gold that has ever been mined has been stored for investment as bullion or as jewelry. As a result, the global gold inventory grows each year and has grown over the past thousand years. And it's now more than 60 times the annual mine production. And so that means that annual mine gold mine production is a tiny portion of gold supply and therefore has a tiny impact on gold prices. And so we almost certainly are going to see an increase in gold mine production if gold price rips higher, but production should remain relatively small relative to gold inventories and gold supply. That also means that if gold supply doesn't change much from year to year, Investor demand is the primary driver of the gold price. And as we discussed earlier, investor demand has the potential to go much higher if the bubbles burst. And so that means the gold price has a lot of upside if the bubbles we discussed earlier burst. So as we're talking about bubbles, Brian, Bitcoin has soared since you were last on the show. Do you think cryptocurrencies will ever replace gold? In short, I highly doubt it. I think, yes, like gold, a cryptocurrency has a limited supply, but the problem is cryptocurrencies in aggregate have unlimited supply. Indeed, there's several new cryptocurrencies that are going to launch this week, and there's going to be a ton that are going to launch over the next few months. And since all these cryptocurrencies compete with each other, the new ones erode the value of the existing ones. With gold, it's totally different because no one's creating new types of gold and no one can create new types of gold. So you don't have this competitive threat from new types of gold constantly being invented. In some ways, I think cryptocurrencies are a bit like baseball cards in the 1990s. You might have had some baseball card sets where there was a limited production run, but in general, any company could have started a new baseball card set or collection, and they all kind of competed with each other. Thus, that unlimited supply eventually crushed prices and caused 90% of baseball card shops to close, for example. And I think we'll eventually see the same thing with cryptocurrencies, where the new supply and the constant barrage of new types of cryptocurrencies eventually causes prices to collapse. The Bitcoin bulls argue that Bitcoin, because of its brand, it's different from all the other cryptocurrencies, and that's going to protect it from all this competition. Yet Bitcoin's cryptocurrency market share, its market cap as a percentage of the total cryptocurrency market cap, has fallen from around 95% to 60% over the last eight years. So in other words, Bitcoin has been losing market share to its competitors. And I think that decline should continue since the new cryptocurrencies that are being launched have lots of advantages over Bitcoin, for instance, better security, faster transactions, lower electricity consumption, greater support from businesses or greater support from regulators. 
In fact, you and I could copy the Bitcoin code and then launch a new and improved version of Bitcoin next week if we wanted to. Thus, the point is, Bitcoin is not unique the way gold is, and its value should eventually be eroded by all this new competition. The other thing I hear cryptocurrency bulls claim is that gold is inferior because it's more difficult to transport and store physical gold than it is to transport or store a cryptocurrency. Yet that's ridiculous because gold can be traded electronically using ETFs, using futures, and you can even trade gold using the same blockchain technology people use to trade cryptocurrencies. In fact, I think there's maybe 40 or so cryptocurrencies that are linked to the price of gold. So the summary is, I wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin loses more than 95% of its value over the next few years. And you don't have to take my word for it. Warren Buffett is called Bitcoin rat poison squared. And Berkshire Hathaway, as we discussed, has instead invested in a gold miner. So I'd be very wary of betting on the Bitcoin bros over Warren Buffett. So could we consider Bitcoin the canary in the coal mine for how big the risk appetite is right now and how much capital is looking for a home outside the US dollar? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Bitcoin very much seems like the epitome of a speculative asset. It's highly correlated with the NASDAQ and Tesla's stock price more than it's correlated with the gold price. And it seems to decline when risk appetite declines. And it wouldn't surprise me if the bond bubble bursts, we see an interest rate increase, and that is accompanied by a massive decline in the value of cryptocurrencies and the value of Bitcoin. It's sort of ironic. I've never, not sure I've ever seen something like this where a lot of the Bitcoin investors seem to be thinking or seem to be saying that they're investing in Bitcoin because they think it's going to do well when risky assets decline because they think it's a counter cyclical investment. But in reality, it seems like it's actually very, a very speculative, a very pro cyclical investment. And I think Bitcoin investors may not get the counter cyclical performance they're expecting. They may get a, actually a, a big decline when these bubbles eventually burst. As we're talking about these bubbles, Brian, does this same basic framework that you just spoke about apply to U.S. real estate? We kind of touched on that earlier, but you know, there seems to be all of these different bubbles, and it seems that we can apply this basic framework to a couple different areas to, let's say, try and identify these bubbles. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think it's a, a great point. It's a very unusual time in history in that we have a major bubble in all the world's bond markets, which are the most important, some of the most important asset classes in the world. We have a major bubble in both the US stock market and in the US real estate market. We have a major bubble in the Chinese real estate market, which is arguably the world's largest and therefore the world's most important asset class. So very unusual and very dangerous time because we have this speculative excess in so many different asset classes. But as we've discussed, uh, that's an amazing opportunity for gold investors. And the good thing is your listeners are very interested in gold. So they're probably doing things to protect themselves against these crazy market conditions. Mm -hmm. So some gold bugs claim that CPI is understated and thus true inflation is a lot higher. Do you agree with this, Brian? Yeah, I don't agree with that because although the CPI is imperfect, I'm skeptical that it's dramatically understating inflation. And one reason we know that is there's private sector, non-government inflation indices such as price stats, and they don't show dramatically higher inflation. And we're also not seeing dramatically higher inflation in US companies' financial results. And that's kind of not surprising because as we discussed earlier in the show, the Fed hasn't been printing money. It's actually been borrowing to fund its bond purchases. Therefore, it's understandable that since the Fed hasn't been printing money, inflation has remained low. I think ultimately, the bond bubble will burst, and it could be very soon. And when that happens, we'll see a dramatic increase in inflation expectations. And that's when we'll see a big increase in the CPI. We'll see a big increase in the private sector inflation indices. We'll see a big increase in inflation in companies' reports, in their earnings reports. 
And then we'll also see a big increase in bond yields. And of course, we'll see a big increase in the price of gold. Excellent, Brian. Do you have any other thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners as we wrap up here? No, thank you very much for having me on the show again. It's always great to talk. Absolutely. Of course, we can find your most recent letter on your website, hcapital.llc. We'll link to it in the show notes as well. And you're at hcapitalllc on Twitter. Anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you very much. Excellent, Brian. Thanks for your time. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.